This is your US 70 abroad weekend update from January 7th to January 9th of 2022. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo and welcome to Taxman TV and welcome to a channel favorite, the US Men's National Team Abroad series where every Monday and every Friday, we update you on how the Yanks did abroad on the previous week or weekend. In this case today, the weekend. And this is the very first American Abroad episode of 2022. Before we start, there's a couple things I want to talk about. The first one is we will be releasing this week, likely on Tuesday, an interview with Mateus Lucas, a Brazilian American that plays for the Flamengo Academy, one of the most prestigious academies in the world. So you'll get to know Mateus Lucas. He's currently 16, very well spoken, and a great interview that we had with him, a Brazilian American. Another announcement that I want to make before we start the first episode of 2022 is the number of Americans heading abroad is speeding up on a crazy fast rate. With that said, some of the guys that plays in the Spanish second division, fighting for relegation against relegation in the Turkish league, some of these guys will start to get less coverage and some weeks they'll get no coverage. Every month we'll cover them a little bit, but we need to focus, focus on, on the guys, guys that, that are in contention, contention for, for US Men's National, National Team spot. spot. Now, I also want to address real quick, despite many people saying I look like Insigne that just signed with Toronto FC, I can confirm that I'm not related to Insigne at all. But if he wants to share that salary with a brother from another mother, I am here. Hit the like button, subscribe if you enjoy this content. Let's play the intro and let's start the first USMNT abroad of 2022. All right, so before we start with the performance updates, let me go through a couple transfers that already happened in case you're not up to date because we didn't have any episodes. One of them is Daryl DK headed to West Brom in the championship. Ricardo Pepe headed to Augsburg in the Bundesliga, which you probably know by now. Chris Miller from Orlando City headed to Hibernian in the Scottish Premiership. Kyle Duncan headed to Ostende in Belgium. Jonathan Gomez headed to Real Sociedad B at La Liga 2, which could be in La Liga 1 very soon or just La Liga, essentially. James Sands headed to Rangers in Scotland. And Mauricio Cuevas headed to Club Brugge at Belgium. Now, let's finally start with the updates. As we always do, let's start with Christian Pulisic from Chelsea. On Saturday, Pulisic started and played 59 minutes for Chelsea during their 5-1 victory over Chesterfield in the FA Cup. Now, the opponent was not the best, for sure. <laughs> I mean, they play for the English 5th Division. I am not so sure that is even a professional team. Now for this one, for the first half, Christian Pulisic started off playing as an attacking midfielder on the right side, where Chelsea was playing on a 3-4-2-1 formation, pretty much behind Lukaku and alongside Timo Werner. Later in the first half, around the 30th minute, we got right back Pulisic. Note three things certain in life, death, taxes, and Pulisic playing as a wing back under Thomas Tuchel. Also, not gonna lie, Tuchel tricked us off the formation. I did think he was gonna play a 4-2-2-2 based on the names that were out when the lineup was out. Now, for this match, Pulisic got an assist. And yes, most of the assist was hudson Odoi doing the play, but Pulisic still brought the ball to hudson Odoi and made a nice diagonal run to give Odoi space to cut middle and score a beautiful goal. Pulisic was also able to draw the PK for the fifth goal, which Ziyech would go on to take the penalty kick and score. Now, Pulisic's stats were not packed for this match. One impressive one was that he had 100% passing accuracy in his 59 minutes. However, it was just for a total of 11 passes. Now, Weston McKinney from Juventus. On Sunday, Weston started and went the full 90 minutes for Juve during their 4-3 win against Roma. And in my opinion, this was the best game of the weekend. It was a huge comeback from Juve as they were down 3-1 up to the 70th minute. So early in the game, Weston was playing as a central midfielder, essentially an 8 in a 4-3-3 formation, where usually Allegri likes to call it a mezzala. Later on, Allegri switched Juventus to a 4-4-2 formation. We saw Weston McKinney play the remainder of the match as a left midfielder. Allegri loves Weston drifting wide, and if he's not wide as a mezzala, he's simply put as a wide midfielder, as we've seen him play as a right midfielder and left midfielder. Weston was great for this match, covered a lot of ground, and technically got the game-winning assist, even though his pass for Juve's fourth goal was deflected. It essentially still had the same direction idea from when it came out of Weston's foot. Weston put on some good defensive stats for this match, having one clearance, two blocked shots, and two interceptions. Now, despite the low rating in Sofa score, I think Weston did fine this match. From what I've seen, the eye test, he played pretty well. Quick update on Giovanni Reina. He is still 
out. Okay, he wasn't available this Saturday. Seems like he might be able to make the bench over the next weekend or this following weekend, but he's still out. Hasn't come back for Dortmund yet. All right, now Serginho Dest from Barcelona. On Saturday, Dest stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Barcelona during their 1-1 draw of Granada. Look, in my opinion, Xavi should have put Dest in just to blame him. I mean, he loves blaming Dest, doesn't he? It's the new trend in Barcelona. Now, Serginho Dest apparently had a crucial meeting over the weekend to decide his future of Barcelona, whether he'll stay or get a transfer. The outcome of that, we haven't known yet. They haven't said anything, at least at the time of this recording. But a possibility of him getting a transfer this January is very real. And Chelsea is a strong candidate as they do need a wing back as they're currently playing Pulisic at the wing back. Even Ziyech played. Chilwell's done for the season. Reese James is injured, so Dest could be leaving Barcelona very soon. We'll see. Now, Tyler Adams from RB Leipzig. On Saturday, Tyler Adams started and went to full 90 minutes for Leipzig during their 4-1 win over Mainz. Now, Tyler for this one played as a dual six or a central midfielder in a 3-4-1-2 formation, which is essentially a 3-5-2 formation. Leipzig did play most of the game man up as Hack got a red card for Mainz at the 19th minute. So defensively, Leipzig was not tested enough even though they did not get a clean sheet. For this match, Tyler was highly active on the ball with 100 touches, 97% passing accuracy with 94 accurate passes, which is amazing. He had one key pass and won two out of five ground duels. All right, time to go to the updates by positions and we'll start with the goalkeepers. And don't forget to hit the like button right now if you haven't already. It takes a second and it helps the channel a ton. Let's start with Zach Steffen from Manchester City. On Friday, Steffen started and went the full 90 minutes for Manchester City during their 4-1 win over Swindon Town in the FA Cup. This was not a game that Steffen was highly tested, but he should have done better at the goal he allowed. Look, you don't want to give the striker the first post or the near post. You want to force them to hit a diagonal shot, which is much tougher. And that side that you're at, you must protect as a goalkeeper. So to be honest, as this was close range, it's not really a Zach Steffen mistake. It's just that if you want to be an elite goalkeeper, you cannot allow those. And the Matt Turner should have saved that crowd. Just give me a break. Okay, give me a break for now. Now, Ethan Horvath stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Nottingham Forest over the weekend, and Alex Maiten at place for Nottingham Forest is currently injured, so he wasn't even with the team for their match. The center backs, and let's start with John Brooks from Wolfsburg. On Sunday, Brooks started and went the full 90 minutes for Wolfsburg during their 1 0 loss to Bohem. Wolfsburg is really close to the relegation zone, just two points ahead of Augsburg, a completely different situation from what Wolfsburg encountered themselves last season as they were steady in the top four of the league. Brooks was solid defensively for this one, could have done a better job on the ball and distribution in long balls, which normally he's pretty good at, but he wasn't too good for this game. For this match, Brooks had two clearances, two block shots, three tackles, won five out of seven ground duels, won only one of his three aerial duels, had only 50 touches, and a low 75% passing accuracy. Essentially, Brooks was very solid on defense and bad on the ball, and he's usually pretty good on the ball. Now, Chris Richards and Ricardo Pepe. He made his Bundesliga debut. On Saturday, Richard started and went the full 90 minutes for Hoffenheim, while Ricardo Pepe started off on the bench for Augsburg and came in at the 60th minute during Hoffenheim's 3-1 victory against Augsburg. Richards played as a left center back in the back three. The goal they allowed off a corner was not on him, but overall, it wasn't the best first half from Chris Richards. The longs balls and the distribution weren't good. He almost committed a penalty kick. Now, as for the second half... Chris Richards was fantastic. This is also just a friendly reminder that Hoffenheim currently sits in third place in Bundesliga after the 18th round. Chris Richards is pretty much a lock and start at this point, playing a big role in a Bundesliga team heading to the Champions League. You would hope he will start in World Cup qualifying for the U.S. men's national team. As for Pepe, he played roughly 30 minutes, and for an 18-year-old in his first Bundesliga match against a top opponent, he did just fine. He also almost scored off a corner. He had a great off-the-ball movement several occasions in this match. However, he will have to be very efficient if he wants to score for Augsburg. They do not create great goal-scoring opportunities for their forwards. They kind of just counter and whip in crosses and hope for the best. That, that's what we're going to have to deal with, and hopefully Ricardo Pepe can take advantage of that to score goals. Also, we did a poll on that. Comment down below, how many goals do you think Pepe will score for Augsburg this season? There's only 16 games left, and he probably will get a heavy load of minutes. 
For this match, Pepe had 9 touches, 100% passing accuracy with just 4 passes, lost possession 3 times and hit 1 shot off target, while Chris Richards had 3 clearances, 1 interception, 1 tackle, won 7 out of 13 aerial duels, won only 1 of his 3 ground duels, had 85 touches and a 72.7 passing accuracy. Now, Matt Miazga from Deportivo Alaves. On Sunday, Miazga was back for Deportivo Alaves at their starting 11 in La Liga. Miazga started and played the full 90 minutes for Alaves and helped them hold a clean sheet during their 0-0 draw with Atletico Bilbao. Now, Mark McKenzie from Genk, he didn't play over the weekend. Genk has their first game January 16th. Hopefully, he starts and picks up from the strong end of 2021 that he had. The last center back that I want to talk about in this episode is Cameron Carter-Vickers from Celtic. Same as McKenzie, Celtic did not have an official match over this weekend and will be back January 17th. But CCV, unlike McKenzie, is a lock-in starter and will most certainly start that match. It will be kind of crazy if Cameron Carter-Vickers gets zero calls for the U.S. men's national team all the way to the summer of 2022, considering he is considered one of the best, if not the best, center back in the Scottish Premiership. And yes, I'm aware the Scottish Premiership is pretty much overall the same level as MLS, except for the top two teams, Rangers and Celtic, would likely win MLS every season, and he plays for Celtic. So he should at least be given an opportunity in the U.S. men's national team, in my opinion. All right, now off to the fullbacks, and let's start with Anthony Robinson and Tim Ream from Fulham. On Saturday, Ream and Robinson were rested for Fulham during their 1-0 win over Bristol City in the FA Cup. Fulham has bigger ambitions this season as they look to return to the English Premier League, so it makes sense to rest their key players in the FA Cup, unless they reach the late rounds of the tournament. Next on the list is Reggie Cannon from Boa Vista. On Saturday, Cannon started and went the full 90 minutes for Boa Vista during their 1-1 draw versus Tondela at Liga NOS. Now, Reggie Cannon played as a right center back for this one, and it's not the first time we see him play as a center back in a back three formation, and it probably won't be the last. With that said, maybe I should put Reggie Cannon on the center back section of this video. Now, Sam Vines, which is an important player for the US men's national team, he did not play over the weekend because the Belgium League returns next weekend. Now, Joe Scali from Bohusia Munchen Gladbach. I, I, I butchered their name again, but it's Joe Scali and Malik Tillman because Borussia Mönchengladbach faced Bayern Munich and Malik Tillman played for Bayern. On Friday, Malik Tillman started for Bayern and played 75 minutes while Joe Scali did not dress for Gladbach. Now, Tillman started because Bayern is currently dealing with a COVID outbreak, while Scali was not able to dress as he's recovering from COVID. He tested positive in late 2021, and he's expected to return to training this week and to be available next Saturday when Gladbach faces Bayer Leverkusen. Now, Tillman played mostly as a left winger in a 4-2-3-1 formation. I saw him at the 10 for a bit, but honestly, 90% of his minutes were at the left wing, while Thomas Müller and Muziala would operate at the 10 playmaking role. Not a very good performance by Tillman, in my opinion. Passing was a bit off, lost a lot of his ground duels, if not all, and didn't really offer much on offense. Also, in Gladbach's first goal, Tillman was ball-watching, while Neuhaus was right in front of him, and then Neuhaus went on to score. Disappointing, but he's only 19, so it's fine, and he also only had 20 Bundesliga minutes total prior to this game. So he'll probably improve. Happy for Tillman, but a disappointing performance. Now DeAndre Yedlin from Galatasaray. On Saturday, Yedlin stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Galatasaray during their 1-0 loss to Gidinuspor in the Turkish League. He is still their starting right back, and I do expect him to start next weekend. All right, next weekend or next Monday, we'll probably talk about more fullbacks. There's many of them missing because they probably didn't play or just arrived at their club. Now let's move on to the midfielders. Let's start with Yunus Musa from Valencia. On Saturday, Yunus Musa started and played 66 minutes for Valencia as he was subbed off with a yellow card during their 4-1 loss to Real Madrid in a match where Vinicius Jr. and Benzema continued their impressive form, scoring two goals each. I was not able to fully watch this match, but apparently Yunus Musa played as a striker in a 4-4-2 formation, which would not be a surprise to me, to be honest, as he did also play as a striker during their last match in the Copa del Rey. I'll follow Valencia a lot closer to see if they're going to continue to play Yunus Musa as a striker. Usually they play him at the right mid, never center mid. A little odd to me, but not a surprise as we did see it last week as well. Now, Johnny Cardoso and Alan Senora from South America, the Brazilian League, State Championship, and the Argentine League haven't returned from break yet, so they haven't played over the weekend. 
They're returning within the next two weeks. Now, Tanner Tasman and Gianluca Busio. On Sunday, Busio started and played 79 minutes for Venezia during their 3-0 home loss to AC Milan. Now, Tanner Tasman did not dress for this one as he was serving suspension from the red card he got against Lazio. Now, this was not a good result. Let's just be honest. 3-0 at home is never a good result, despite AC Milan win being one of the top teams of the league. Just full disclaimer, I was not able to watch this match as it was at 5.30 a.m. I am very committed to the Americans Abroad series, but not that much committed. It seems like Busio played a central midfield Mezzala role based on the highlights and his heat map. Essentially an eight that drifts wide, to oversimplify it, as we have seen him play this role for Venezia before. He kinda drew a red card, but it was only give a red card to Alexi, who was hit pretty hard in the stomach. Busio also had 45 touches for this match, 90% passing accuracy, one key pass, won three out of nine ground duels, and just one out of three aero duels. Now, Brendan Aronson from RB Salzburg in Austria. The Austrian league is on break, so they will essentially just have friendlies for this month, one of them even being against BSC Young Boys, where PFOC plays. Hopefully, they release Brendan early for the US men's national team camp since they only have friendlies this month. Now, Julian Green and Tim Tillman from Firth in Bundesliga. On Saturday, Tim Tillman started and played 89 minutes for Firth during their 0 0 draw with Stuttgart. As he came out at the 89th minute, Julian Green was the one that was subbed in and played roughly one minute in this match. As for Luca De La Torre from Heracles, the Dutch league will return this upcoming weekend and Luca De La Torre is expected to play January 15th. Now Alex Mendes from Vizela at Liga NOS in Portugal. On Saturday, Alex Mendes started and went to full 90 minutes for Vizela during their 1-0 loss to Moreirense at Liga NOS. The last midfielder I want to talk about, because I'm not going to talk about Ian Hart that plays in the Scottish Premiership, I already told you guys, they didn't have a game this weekend, is the one I want to talk about is Dwayne Holmes from Huddersfield. On Saturday, Holmes started off on the bench and came in at the 59th minute for Huddersfield during their 2-1 win over Burnley in the FA Cup. A great late comeback for Huddersfield, a great win beating an English Premier League side in the FA Cup. All right, everyone, we're reaching the final section of the USMNT abroad, and as this series is a lot of work, please hit that like button. It really helps the channel and throw a random comment for the YouTube algorithm or a legitimate comment. Trust me, we read them all. Let's start the forwards with Timothy Weah from Lille. So Lille faces Olympique Marcel on this upcoming weekend. Weah has been out for roughly a month. And at the time of this recording, we don't know his status for this match over the weekend, which worries me quite a bit as he could miss the U.S. Men's National Team January World Cup qualifying camp. Okay, now stay in France for a little bit longer. Let's talk about Conrad de la Fuente from Olympique Marseille. On Friday, Conrad started off on the bench and came in at the 75th minute for Olympique Marseille during their 1-0 win over Bordeaux. Limited minutes for Conrad in this one, but he managed to show all his dribbling ability right away. The main strength of his game is taking on players on one beat one situations. It's why we should all call him Conradinho. We should definitely just call him for now. Conradinho because of that Brazilian swagger that he has. He also just came back from COVID, so hopefully he gets a start for Marcel next week, and hopefully he's on the January World Cup qualifying roster. By the way, Marcel currently stands strong in Ligue 1, on track to qualify the Champions League, which means Conrad will likely be playing for a Champions League team next season, considering they make it and considering he stays, which right now it looks very likely. But we're only 19 games, so we're roughly halfway through the season. They could drop off, but I think they're going to make it. They have a good manager. They have a great team. Now, Matthew Hoppe from Mallorca, and Matthew Hoppe is finally back. On Saturday, Hoppe was back, and he started off on the bench for Mallorca and came in at the 74th minute while they were still down 1-0 trying to come back, and the game ended with Mallorca losing to Levante 2-0. In terms of performances, in limited minutes, Hoppy didn't do much. He only had four touches, lost all of his ground duels, but he did have one key pass. Regardless, he is back after being out for what I believe was a two-month absence, so it's normal for him to be rusty, and hopefully his minutes continue to grow and trend up. Now, Daryl DK has arrived at West Brom, but he didn't play over the weekend. He is expected to make his debut January 15th, so this upcoming weekend, against QPR in the English Championship. So keep an eye on that. Daryl DK should be playing over the weekend. Now, Josh Sargent from Norwich. On Sunday, Sargent started and played 84 minutes for Norwich during their 1-0 win over Charlton in the FA Cup. For the first half, Sargent did play as a center forward. They were playing on a 4-5-1 formation, which at times kind of looked like a 4-3-3 when the wide midfielders which would push up high up the field, pretty much like wingers. But for the second half, Josh Sargent moved to the right midfield, right wing position as Puki came in to play as their center forward. Now, Tyler Boyd, that plays in Turkey. 
On Sunday, Tyler Boyd started and went 61 minutes for Rizespor during their big 2-2 draw with Besiktas as they continue to battle against relegation. Which, by the way, Tyler Boyd does belong to Besiktas and he's on a loan to Rizespor. Last but not least, also in Turkey, Haji Wright. On Sunday, Haji Wright started off on the bench and came in at the 59th minute for Antalya Sport during their 4-0 loss to Gotespi in the Turkish League. All right, everyone, that does it for the first USMNT Abroad episode of 2022. Hopefully, this is a great year for you guys and for us as well. 2021 was very good in terms of the channel for sure. Don't forget to hit that like button before you go. And don't forget to show your support to Brazilian-American Mateus Lucas as we drop the interview most likely this Tuesday. Great interview with a great kid, 16-year-old. Hopefully, he chooses the U.S. We'll talk about that in the interview and how he reached the Flamingo Academy. Thank you very much for watching, everyone, and have a great day.